Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my troll. shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll share Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday. Good morning, people. If you'd like to make your way in and grab a seat, so all the kids out of the back room, you need to come out front now. Well, good morning and welcome to uh, this morning's service. Let's stand and sing to our great, wonderful God. Oh 
Father, we thank you that you are the Lord of heaven and earth. And yet you gave your son to us. You came down, you sent your son down to this earth to be our salvation. Lord, as we come here this morning to worship and praise you, Lord, we pray that our, the words of our lips and the meditation of our heart, Lord, will be acceptable to you. Lord, we pray for your blessing on this service, Lord, and later on as Pastor Tim brings us the message that you've given him for us, we pray for your blessing in this time. And Lord, we pray that your name will be glorified in all that we do and all that we say. In your mighty name, amen.
majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. Thank you. Please take a seat. Well, welcome to Mount Isa Baptist Church this morning. Um, if you're a regular, it's good to have you with us. And if you're visiting, it's great to have you with us also joining in and also for those who may be joining in online watching the, um, the live stream. Please, at the end of the service, stay around for a cup of tea and coffee and uh, morning tea. Um, just a few other announcements. Coming up, the rodeo cleanup. The chaplaincy committee would like to encourage people to help with the rodeo cleanup. Uh, the rodeo provides $10,000 towards supporting the chaplain, chaplains in our schools. So please uh, consider yourself making it available between the 13th and the 15th of August. The best thing about it is whatever day that you're volunteering, you get in for free. So you get to watch the rodeo as well, plus helping and cleaning up. And it is a great um, a source for funds for our chaplains. Do we have a, is, does anyone know if there's a link or anything where people sign up onto? In the newsletter, yep. And if you haven't got access to that, probably catch up with Pastor Tim, maybe, and you can sort something out there. Northreach Baptist Church will be, um, we've got dates locked in for the 24th of September through to October 4th. They'll be running a kids holiday club and helping us also landscaping the slope up in the car park. Uh, we do need some preparation and sloping the can be for that. So there is going to be a working bee on the 28th of um, this month from 8 to 11. Um, please come along and join in if you're able to do that. Uh, morning tea is provided. Um, Men's Hangar Night is on this Tuesday night. If you haven't been to Men's Hangar Night and you'd like to know a bit more about it, come and see me. Um, out at the Salvation Army Hangar at the airport, uh, it's a great time for um, folks to get together to share and also um, enjoy a good uh, steak burger. Um, last week we had, we had the privilege of having um, Colin Weber and his wife from the Gideons here to speak with us. They work with um, Bible distribution. Uh, we took up an offering and collected $400, which will go towards continuing their ministry. And um, Sunshine Corner time. So kids that are in kindy up to grade three will be heading off up to the top hall. And junior church, grade three to grade seven, if you'd like to head out to the back room. If I could just ask the... Um, oh, actually, so one other thing that... Um, Um, after the service, there is a jam session for musos and vocalists and anyone else if you'd like to hang around and join in on that. Um, but also just another announcement here that came through for the, um, from Salvation Army regarding their Crossroads um, dinner that they have on the Thursday night. They're short-staffed over August and we'd really appreciate some help during, um, help during this time. Uh, this is a family-friendly event, so please feel free to um, bring your whole family. Um, they're looking for helpers from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on the Thursday nights to serve meals and clean up. You also get to get a free meal and, um, and uh, some fellowship uh, as well. And also any help to cook in their kitchen on Thursday afternoon from 2 to 3.30. Um, there are child-friendly playrooms and play equipment that they can use to um, bring the kids. Um, so the nights they're looking for is August the 5th, August the 12th, August 19th and August the 26th. So um, I've already signed myself in the bangle up for the um, August the 12th. She knows about it now. And uh, it's a great way for um, community service, but also just helping out the Salvation Army in their, uh, their ministry. If I could ask the um, stewards if they could take up the offering.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. Lord, we just thank you this morning for able to bring back a, a portion of that um, to you in these offerings. The Lord, for what's been put in the bag this morning, but also through electronic funds. Lord, we just thank you that um, you provide for us. And Lord, we pray that um, these monies that we give back will be used wisely within the church as we seek to serve you in this community. Pray your blessing upon this in your name. Amen. I could ask uh, Lynn to come up for the Bible reading, thanks. Morning. Morning, everyone. Um, uh, this morning we're, we're reading from um, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19, if you wanted to find that. In your Bibles, um, 1 Samuel chapter 19, and it's about Saul trying to kill David. So up on the screen. Um, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more, war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Mikhail said, he is ill. Then Saul sent men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Mikhail, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he could escape? Mikhail told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But 
when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it and he sent more men and they prophesied too. Saul, men, Saul sent men a third time and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left Ramah and went to the great cistern at Siku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah. But the Spirit of God came even on him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He laid naked all day and all night. That is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? May God help us in our understanding. First then we'll sing this song and then after that um, Jesse will come up and lead communion. As we come now to take part in this precious feast and how blessed are we to be invited to this supper let us draw near with reverent confidence before the throne of god 
as we prepare to eat this bread and drink this cup in which we proclaim our Lord's death, knowing that everyone who does so in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we now prepare to take this bread and cup in remembrance of the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, may we, with lips that confess your name, offer you a sacrifice of praise, repenting and sorrowing for our sins. For it is right and wonderfully good to praise and worship you. You are the one true and living God, King of kings and Lord of lords, eternal, immortal, invisible, unchanging, above all and through all and in all. Yet when we were dead in our sins and lusts, you did not spare your own son, but gave him over for us all and made us alive in him, raising us with Christ and securing our life where he is, seated at your right hand. Lord, for all this and more, we can do nothing but bring you thanks, marveling also at your graciousness in deigning to hear this prayer we utter, allowing us to join the myriad angels and all creation before your throne, who say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Lord God, you are holy and altogether lovely, and in your holy love you gave your only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And he emptied himself, being made in the likeness of men, and in carrying out your eternal purpose, was obedient to the point of death on a cross, fulfilling all righteousness. And on that night, as he approached that death, he shared this meal with his disciples, promising to eat and drink it new with us in your kingdom. Therefore, remembering his commandment and all that you have done for us, our precious Jesus torture, death upon that cross, burial in that tomb, resurrection on the third day and ascension into heaven to reign at your right hand until he comes again with power and glory. Lord, remembering all this, may we bow before you in awe and reverence and love and gratitude. Grant us by your Holy Spirit to take this bread and cup in a worthy manner this morning. And in so doing, to take part in what it sets forth, that is that we may spiritually but truly feed by faith on the flesh and blood of Christ, that we may have eternal life in him. We ask all these things in his glorious name. Amen. When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This bread is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take a few moments and eat the bread in your own time. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us drink together.
Lord, may your promises be sealed to us, that we may know that just so surely as we have eaten this bread and drunk this cup, which nourish our earthly lives, so surely has Christ offered himself and his blood been shed for the remission of our sins and the nourishment and life of our souls. So remembering and proclaiming his death and resurrection, may we live upon the bread of life come down from heaven and cleansed in his blood, may we eagerly long for the coming of our Lord Jesus and the marriage supper of the Lamb, in whose name we pray. Amen. Join with me as we sing this next song and after that Pastor Tim will bring his message. to see you here. Welcome to our regulars and of course to our visitors and guests as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you got the chance to uh, speak to Cindy McGarvey this week, I trust that you uh, found it very helpful to your life and faith and um, she gave a, a very good seminar here on Thursday night about the importance of having respons responsible men uh, in our families, in our churches. And if you didn't get the chance to watch it, we've recorded it and we'll put it on the, um, the website and on the newsletter. And she's left us with a few copies of her book, Lost Boys, so if you are still keen to read it, uh, come up to me after the service and I've got about two or three copies that she's left here uh, to pass on to people, so uh, it's, it's a very good book. Uh, let me pray. 
Father, we thank you for your holy, inerrant and life-giving word. We praise you that no matter how hard our enemies rail against your people, that you are good to us. Amen. Uh, well, I've read lots of stories in the last uh, six months or so about great escapes. Usually in the sort of what I'm reading at the moment, it's been either escapes from the gulags or people uh, bearing underneath the, uh, east, uh, the, the wall in East Germany to, to escape. But uh, one of the ones that I particularly found somewhat amusing was an attempt from a, a, a escape attempt from a prison labor camp in Soviet Russia. Uh, there were some men doing some forced labor and a, a lorry or a ute pulled up with some fencing material. And so these men seeking a means of potential escape volunteered to unload this truck. And they're thinking, well, should we make a break for it? Uh, they had no equipment on them, no food or no resources to, once they got out. Uh, but but uh, the, the, the opportunity for the escape was right there. Uh, the, so, so they made a break for it. The, the gate and the sentry towers were all downhill from where they were. Uh, the truck was parked, and if they could get enough speed, they'd be able to go down and break the, through the gate and be out of gunfire range within a matter of seconds. Uh, so they decided they would go. Uh, three of the prisoners lay down in the back of the, the lorry, the back of the truck, while a fourth prisoner, by the name of Jazdik, got the attention of the lorry driver to say, well, we finished unloading the, the lorry, you're good to go. Now, this truck was of the age long before my time that you needed to, needed to be primed with a crank. I wouldn't know anything about that, but it needed to be primed with a crank, and so the driver hopped in the driver's seat, and Jazdik began winding the crank. The engine wouldn't start. So Jazdik suggested that the driver and he swap places. And the driver didn't realize what was going on, uh, obliged, they swapped places, the driver turned the crank, uh, the engine turned over and the lorry began rushing toward the gate. Jazdik had tampered with the throttle in order to fool the driver. And the driver was in no hurry to jump in, he just thought that, the, 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 that Jazdik was going to stop the, the lorry, but instead it crashed through the gate at good speed. It all looked like a big mistake, so the guards just fired warning shots in the air, uh, and the truck sped around several bends, the three prisoners in the back kept their heads down, and then suddenly the lorry came to an abrupt stop. Jazdik cried out in despair that he had taken a wrong turn. They were outside the gates of a mine that had its own guards and, and sentry with guns and, and the like. But the prisoners had an explanation. They said the three prisoners in the back were just taking a, having a rest and they didn't realize what was going on. When the, when the truck began to move, and Jazdik, well, he was just inexperienced, didn't know how to handle the lorry once it took off, and so they got off with a beating. There's something exhilarating about escape stories that makes it difficult to put a book down or a story down or stop watching the movie. You know, will they get away? Will they get caught? Will Steve McQueen be able to jump over the fence in his motorbike? Here in chapter 19, we have an escape. It's a key theme of this passage. Escape is mentioned five times. And not only do we see David escape from King Saul, we see just how involved God is in, in saving King Saul throughout this great escape and protecting his anointed king. And David, in fact, wrote a psalm about this event in his life, and it describes his hope in God, his fortress. And, and he knows that the actions of his bloodthirsty enemies are seen uh, by God. God doesn't forget it. God knows what's going on. And it's in Psalm 59. A part of it reads, But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You laugh at my enemies. You hold all the nations in derision, or that is, you mock the nations for their attempts against God's people. And so King Saul is the perfect biblical example of God's mocking rebuke against man's sin and unbelief, and particularly highlighted in just how pointless Saul's attempt, just how pointless Saul's plan to capture and kill David really are. Saul was blinded, as we saw last week, by jealous rage uh, to kill David. But even more so, his rage was directed toward God and his glorious gospel of grace. Saul wanted to preserve his own kingdom. This is my kingdom. I'm the king. Not realizing that David was the representative, representative of God's kingdom of, on earth uh, at this period of time. And so to snuff out David would be to snuff out God's glorious gospel of grace. Did Saul have a hope on earth to rage and battle against God? Not, of, of course not. He had no hope of defeating God's anointed king. And in this uh, psalm, in Psalm 59, uh, David describes just how easy it is for God to overthrow his enemies. He writes, Make them totter by your power 
and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Let them be trapped in their pride. Consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more. And so David is escaping for his life from this mad king. And again, this passage will emphasize for us again that the hostilities of this world ultimately serves God and his purposes. The harder, as we saw last week, the harder that Saul pushed against David to kill him, the more loving the purposes of God and his uh, progress for his people prevailed. And that's good news for us, good news to the family of God, because we can speak with confidence as well of a loving and protective father in this uncertain world. And this truth is beautifully illustrated as David eludes Saul over and over again. Well, Saul's descent into sin caused him to rage against David. This, of course, is the effect of unrepentant sin. Repentance would have brought Saul into a right relationship with God and calmed his jealous soul. But instead, we see the irrational effects of sin continue to take hold. Uh, Remember last week, Saul's attempts at killing David had failed. Uh, We saw there that the harder that Saul pushed, uh, the greater God's purposes prevailed, the more that God's goodness prevailed in the life of of David. But now Saul devises new schemes to kill his arch enemy and does so at a secret meeting. In verse 1, Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Why did Saul invite Jonathan? You know, Saul knows that Jonathan has made a covenant with David and they're, they're best of friends. And furthermore, Saul knows how well that David is loved by the nation. David is, of course, the giant killer. An attempt on David's life would lead to civil strife. Why would Saul be so brazen in his plans and hold this secret meeting with his servants? Uh, Because Saul's servants would have known that, well, this was dumb. David was just too well loved. We can't take David's life. It'll split the kingdom. But this is what sin does to us. It blinds us to reality. The, The reality that this is God's world and that we are to live God's way in his world And Saul's twisted heart has caused him to think that the other people around him are just as twisted as he is and that they would easily be corrupted. And here's why we need that that Christian virtue of obedience to God's commands, namely that when we attempted to compromise, that we have a foundation of which to remain pure and honest in our actions. And Saul and his twisted uh, thinking probably thought that uh, Jonathan would agree well, you know, if I, if I can just convince Jonathan, he'll agree because Jonathan, I can tell Jonathan what's at stake. Uh, you know, Jonathan, uh, David's popularity will mean that he will try and take the throne off you. You won't be king if, this, if, if, jo- if David, uh, if, if his popularity rises. Uh, but Jonathan, godly Jonathan, as we saw previously, he'd already submitted all of his privileges to the throne of God, to the hands of God. Uh, For Jonathan, it's no longer a matter if he becomes king or not. Uh, Jonathan, we saw, is satisfied in the loving embrace of his God and the warmth of his true friend, David. Likewise, Saul probably thought the same thing as well for his servants. Well, if David gets the throne, you know, all my public servants, you guys will be out of office as well. You won't have a job. You won't have the privileges of being the servants of the king. And so there was a test here for Jonathan that we see Jonathan's faithful heart pass the test easily. Uh, His friendship with David had far more purpose than any temporary privileges that he could have. For Jonathan, God was worthy of all his life, even if it meant great temporary loss. Um, I recently watched an interview with Pastor Tim Stevens, a Baptist pastor in Canada. And if you've been watching some of the news events there, the, the churches there have been shut down for over a year, much different from our circumstances here. And he couldn't in good conscience continue to remain closed any longer. And so he opened up and was issued with several court summons worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. He's been thrown in jail three times now. And in the interview, he says each step of the way, he had to count the cost. He and his wife had to consider, are they willing to lose their life, or sorry, their, their, their jobs and their house over the matter? And they concluded, yes, Jesus is worthy. We could lose our house and Jesus will still take care of us. And so like Jonathan and like Tim, this pastor, Tim Stevens, we need to ask, is Christ worthy of all of our life? Jonathan was satisfied with God. The pastors in Canada that are going to jail, many of them, several of them, who are also satisfied in God, and we too can be as well. 
Well, Jonathan wouldn't lift a blade, uh, let alone a finger, against his friend. Why? Well, because we read, uh, Jonathan's uh, Saul's son delighted much in David. And so Jonathan did just as we would expect. He warned his dear, warned his dear friend, even against the will of his king and his father. This is verse 2. Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning, stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And so while David stays out of sight, Jonathan would seek to reason with his father. And once again, Jonathan gives us an example of how the people of God should respond with truth and grace toward those who, in the grips of sin and unbelief. Jonathan was both humble and bold in his attempt to reason with his father. And he does so by providing wisdom along with direct appeals uh, to the word of God. Jonathan's goal was to impress on his father that David was innocent, which he was. It was Saul's jealousy that driven, had driven Saul to this irrationality. Uh, Jonathan's approach was an appeal first to common grace, a theological term that refers to the way that God works in this world to preserve uh, his people. Have you ever wondered, if we're all born into sin, why aren't we all as bad as we could be? Well, it's because of God's common grace in this world restraining sin and allows otherwise sinful people to act in some accord with God's law. And so Jonathan's first appeal to his father is an appeal to common grace. This is verse 4 and 5. Uh, his deeds, speaking about David, David's deeds have brought good to you, Saul, for he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced. This is a good thing to do, isn't it? Uh, to reason on the basis of common morality and right thinking. And Jonathan does this here. Well, David's a good man. He fought on your behalf for your people. Uh, I recently had a conversation with Robbie Catter about the euthanasia legislation that's being passed through, uh, going to be reviewed in Parliament. And Robbie explained that he would oppose the bill and argue in such a way that would appeal to reason. He said that because palliative care was not well-funded and staffed in northern Queensland, as it was in southeast, that there'll be a divide in people accessing uh, the euthanasia. In Brisbane, where there was more palliative care options, people would likely opt for the palliative care. But he, ex he, he explained that in more remote areas, where there were less options for relief of suffering, people would more likely opt for euthanasia. And so Robbie will argue in a way that Jonathan argues here. That is an appeal to common sense and rationality. And so please pray that God's common grace would restrain this euthanasia bill as it goes through. And perhaps use uh, Robbie's argument as a means of restraining and holding back this proposal. But while common grace may restrain evil for a short period, uh, it's, necessary, it's necessary on the part of the Christian as well to confront evil with direct appeals to Scripture. And Jonathan does this as well. He appeals to Scripture. He informs Saul directly that his proposals was outright sin. In verse 4 and 5, he says, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he's not sinned against you. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And this warning about innocent blood is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 19, in which those guilty of innocent bloodshed are to be cursed. Now, when the Baptist Union asked for the pastors to make a submission regarding the euthanasia bill, this is the path that I took. Uh, giving the warnings of Scripture, certainly more a direct warning. The warnings of Scripture don't resound in the ears of political correctness. But there are times that we need to say that this is a sin, this is evil. And as uh, we can stand in the line of the Old Testament prophets, we can say, well, hear and no further, and to provide the divine warning that this, uh, th we, we, we can't, as people, shed uh, innocent blood. This is God's world, and it operates according to God's principles. And so for a time, the common grace of God prevailed in the life of Saul. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan for a period of time. Sorry, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Uh, verse 6, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, David shall not be put to death. And God acts in a similar way today to preserve his people and allow the grace of his gospel to spread I like how Roger Ellsworth writes it. He says, God's primary purpose, uh, God primarily preserves his cause through his children 
testifying to the grace of God in a dark world. We can say of Christianity what Jonathan said of David, David has done good to you, why should you do David harm? Well, for a brief period, life seems to return to normal in Israel. Jonathan uh, brought David once again into the presence of King Saul. David returned to the king's service and he goes to battle in verse 7 and 8. And Saul and the nation of Israel were once again blessed. Uh, as the king had taken to heart for a period of time the warnings of Jonathan not to kill David. But Jonathan provided wise counsel. And so David continued to work salvation through his sword for the nation as he defeated uh, the Philistine. But what happened, do you remember back to last week, what happened every time David was victorious in battle? What did it do to Saul every time that David came back victorious? Well, last week we saw that when the nation praised David, when he came back victorious from battle, uh, Saul always became jealous. And so once again, Saul relapses into jealousy as he sees David coming back from battle. And remember that Saul is a man is under God's judgment. And that judgment is a very real spiritual element. The Lord sends a harmful spirit to afflict Saul. We may think, well, this is all very quite disturbing, that Saul once again has gone back on his word, that he's persistent in his sin, that once again this harmful or evil spirit is back upon Saul's life. But this is what sin does. It overturns God's good order, and God responds in such a way to remind Saul, to remind us that sin, our sin, is horrendous. Saul is a picture for us of what it's like to be in rebellion against God. And for a moment, Saul was restrained by common grace, but he'd not been born again to a living hope through saving grace. And he's still as double-minded as he ever was. David returns from battle, and we have a telltale sign of Saul's return to madness. Uh, Saul sat in his house with spear in his hand. Saul's spear always seems to be close by, doesn't it? Always seems to be grabbing, going for his spear. And what does David do? He's just been, once again, the successful hero on the battlefield. Does he come back basking in, in, in praise? No, he slips right back into caring, the pastoral care of this king, playing the liar as he does. A.W. Pink writes it like this, of the, the need for this godly virtue, uh, the virtue of godly character like David. One who had been so successful upon the battlefield and was held in such honour by the people might have deemed such a service as beneath his dignity. But a gracious man considers no ministry too humble by which he may do good to another. Well, we could almost set our clocks to Saul's jealous outburst because while David plays, Saul once again hurls a spear at David. But Saul doesn't nail David with a spear. He misses and hits the wall, giving time to David, to escape. How do we explain Saul's behaviour? We've already explained it a few times now, but we can do it again. A moment ago, Saul had sworn by the name of the Lord that, hey, David will live. But as we've constantly seen, Saul was under the power of sin, a slave to sin. He's under this, this, this destructive power that turns God's good order upside down. Sin is a power that call, calls good evil and evil good. And Saul was living this lie. Saul's reality wasn't centered around God and his objective truth. And so Saul had replaced God's ordered reality, God's good reality, with, with Saul's own reality, with his own unordered reality, which was irrational and has now at times become just downright absurd. And we're to live, as we know, as God's people, to live for God's glory and pleasure. But when we destroy the foundation of God's objectivity, what is right and good is replaced with what I want, what I want. I like how C.S. Lewis puts it in his book, The Abolition of Man. He speaks of the conditioners, and when he uses that term, he means those people in positions of power and influence and control, just like King Saul is here. He says, the conditioners therefore must come to be motivated simply by their own pleasure. Those who stand outside of all judgment, judgments of value cannot have any ground for preferring one of their own impulses to another except the emotional strength of that impulse. So Saul has no eternal anchor, no objective anchor of which he is guiding his life by. He's guided by his own impulses, the main one being, kill David, he's a better man than I am, it makes me jealous. So Saul is living 
as he descends into jealousy. He's living this demented lie that's turned his reality upside down, that causes him to backtrack on his word, to contradict himself and to constantly return to his impulses of sin, to hurl the, the, the spear over and over again. As Saul's an illustration of Peter's words in 2 Peter 2, the dog returns to its own vomit and the so after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. Not a very good picture of, to, to describe someone by, is it? But this is Saul. And in this regard, Saul presents to us a picture of what's true for everyone who is restrained by common grace, yet is ultimately conquered by lust and their anger and their jealousy and a host of other evils, namely that without Christ, our sin is unconquerable. Gordon Ketty says it like this, Without a saving change, a sinner is a mess. He hardly knows himself. He thinks he's wise when in fact he's a fool. And even though he knows that God will judge wickedness, he goes on doing it as if he had a death wish and encourages others along the same fatal road. This is why we need so much to be saved by the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. If there ever was a man who illustrated our need for saving, this, that man was King Saul. But Saul let sin reign in his mortal, mortal body and would, would obey. He obeyed the passions and the impulses of his sinful nature. That's Romans 6.12 where Paul says, don't let sin reign in your life. But Saul did let sin reign in his life. And so sin, Saul is given over to this irrationality of sin and also to this harmful spirit. Now we've addressed the harmful spirit in a few sermons ago. So if you wanted to... Uh, Consider that a bit more. Go back to one of those sermons a few uh, sermons ago uh, where I've addressed it. But how, how do we explain it? Uh, is your picture of God this doting grandfather, an unobtrusive gentleman that never does anything against our will? Well, I'll say, if that's your position, I think your, your view of God is incorrect. Here we see God interve intervenes directly in the lives of people in judgment and does so here by sending this harmful spirit the writer of the Hebrews tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so Saul in his sinful pursuits has not escaped God. That's what he's trying to do, be the king of his own kingdom. He's trying to escape God, to be, I'm the king. But what's happened? He's simply fallen into the hands of God in a different way, in judgment. And so our response should be godly fear, not questioning God for his actions here, but rather looking on in awe, knowing that God is free to exercise his infinite power, however he pleases. Saul had hearted his heart against God. And so the greatest of Saul's problems was the active judgment of God in his life. And there's an interplay here of human responsibility and God's action. Saul had no desire to be godly. Now, his desire was for his sin, but Saul and God did not allow God did not allow Saul to be godly. And we see this in a few different places. Paul gives us a warning in Ephesians chapter 4. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sin go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And so for us, there are countless evil influences in the world that we are warned of and that we are to guard our hearts against and not let our, uh, our hearts... Uh, to be angry and let the sun go down on, to, on our angry hearts, not allowing sin to grow and take hold in our hearts. But Saul does. He does let uh, the sun go down on his anger and his jealousy. And so his sin was met with judgment. And we see this judgment as we contrast Saul and David. In his evil impulses, Saul pursues David. However, how does God deal with David? Well, God protects David. Which is why the spear, Saul's spear, continues to miss. God is good to David. And as God preserves David, Saul falls deeper and deeper into apostasy, into madness, into his sinful desires, even as he tries to kill this king more and more and more. As a second ago, I said that God didn't allow Saul to be godly. And this is the testimony of Paul in, chapter, in Romans chapter 1. There, Paul speaks of sinful men and women who won't obey God and acknowledge God. And Paul says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions and to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Well, this is the greatest judgment of God in this life uh, that, that, that says, that where, where God says to us, well, if you like your sin so much, I will remove my hand of restraint, my common grace, and you will reap the reward of your sin, destruction and death. 
And I think we can say with confidence, this is the judgment that our generation is experiencing. Our society has largely said, well, we want to live without restraint, to live as though we're kings and queens of our own world. And God is making good on his promises of Romans chapter 1. Well, let's just focus again on David. Because he's now fled from Saul. But Saul will not relent. Saul sends the ancient equivalent of the Gestapo to watch David. But unlike the Gestapo, they don't enter the hour in the early mornings to instill the most amount of fear. They kindly wait until morning, giving time to David to escape once again. Now, the word of this plot against David's life has reached Saul's daughter and David's wife, Michal. And, and uh, in her loyalty, she acts to help her husband, David. Now, if you do turn to Psalm 59, you'll read the heading of the psalm as something like this. A mictam of David when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. Sometimes we look at those headings in the psalms and we just think that they've been added by the translators. But those headings are understood to be inspired. They are in the original manuscripts. And so we have one of David's psalms that describes that night where he was waiting uh, for the people outside to come and get him. Imaginably, in a state of concern, if you know that your house is being watched by uh, the enemy. And he writes in verse 2, Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. Perhaps how, consider how many Christ, Christians in history have felt this anguish knowing that the powers that be were coming for them. Not because of any wrongdoing on their behalf, but because of their obedience to God and their faith. And David here stands in the shadow of Christ, our perfect saviour, who never sinned, but was constantly watched by the Pharisees who endeavoured to entrap him. Not because of any wrongdoing that Jesus had done, but because of their irrational hatred for their saviour. And there's two responses to Jesus that we see in these chapters of Samuel. There are those who have eyes to see the glory of their saviour, like Jonathan. There are others who see the saviour only as a threat to their personal lives, their personal autonomy. You know, I want to live how I want. I will not submit to the rule of the great king. This is how Saul responds to David, the future king. The righteous character of David exposed Sin, Saul's sinful heart and was a threat to his self-rule. How do you respond to Christ? Do you find yourself in one of these two characters, in Saul or Jonathan? Is Christ, David stands in the shadow of Christ, is Christ a threat to your self-rule in your life? Or is he the very desire of your heart, just as Jonathan David are the warmest of friends, the one that you warmly embrace for hope and help in this life and the next. God was, of course, committed to protecting his servant David and exposing Saul's sinful heart. Nothing would happen to David outside of God's sovereign plan. And here David uses Michal, Saul's own daughter, to protect David. So we read, uh, Michal's, uh, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. Now Michal, like her father Saul, doesn't seem to have a true faith. And later on, Michal would despise David. You remember in a chapter or two, she despises David as the ark comes back into Jerusalem and David dances with uh, abandon before the ark of the Lord. She and she looks on and despises the king. But at this moment, she helps her husband escape and does so with a deceptive trick, much like that story at the start, a daring escapes often includes some sort of deception. But the deception here makes us ask some questions, because the deception revolves around using a household idol in order to buy some time. Macal took an image and laid it on the bed and a pillow of goat's hair at, the, at its end and covered it with clothes. And when Saul sent messages to take David, she said, he's sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed, and the pillow of goat's hair at its head. And we think, why is there an idol in David's household? Now, this was, of course, a violation of keeping God's command. The Israelites weren't permitted to keep any graven image of their God or any gods. There's no explanation given here in this passage, so it leaves us to draw our own conclusions. And I think the best conclusion was that Michal 
and David were unequally yoked, which explains Michal's later disgust for her husband and gives us for the, the motivation for David's polygamy. He didn't love his wife as he should because they didn't have the common bond of faith. Well, when Saul finally came for David, he uncovered the deception. Now, Saul is angry. He says, why have you deceived me? And Michal replies, David said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Which implies that Michal is implying that David, my husband, has threatened me with my, lo with my life if I don't let him go, uh, which, which he hadn't. And so once again reveals that Michal was more concerned about her life than the reputation of her husband. And what are we to make of all this? Well, we see even in the life of godly David a seed that will germinate into sinful strife. David couldn't keep his house in order. And so physically, Michal's actions seem commendable. She saves her husband. But spiritually, her actions are, are, are reprehensible. She keeps an idol. She slanders her husband to save his life. And all of this tells us that although David was a godly man, he was not God. He was not the perfect saviour. He was in need just of a, of a saviour, just like us. And we will see that uh, as, as David falls into sin with Bathsheba, that David is not God. David also needs a saviour. There's only one hero in the Bible, and it's Jesus. This sin would cause da havoc in David's life, just as sin causes havoc in all of our lives. Well, once again, David is on the run. He flees to nearby Ramah. And it seems in Psalm 59 that while David was on the run, he had a song in his heart. Wouldn't it be great to do this when we know that our enemies are pursuing us, that the first thing that comes to mind is to sing to God. Psalm 59, we read, But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. That's probably the morning as he's ducked out the window running to Ramah to see Samuel. He knows he's got uh, people behind him chasing him, but he trusts in God. The troubles of the world, where do they drive David? Where did the thought of his pursuers drive David? They drove him into the arms of God. Samuel is at Ramah, and David conveys to Samuel all that Saul had done. And so Samuel and David move a little further north to the pasture lands that surround Ramah to a place called Naioth. Perhaps it was where Saul's homestead, Saul's, uh, Samuel's home was. But Saul has spies everywhere. And so the intel is passed on to Saul. David's at Naoth. And so in verse 20 and 21, we read what happens next. Then Saul sent messages to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing at the head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. When it was told, when it was told Saul, he sent other messages. And they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. It's an incredible scene. There's divine, quite some divine humor here as well. Saul's men come to arrest David. But what's the outcome? They are overcome by the Holy Spirit and can, can't carry on with their appointed task of murder. And what, what, what's their, what do they do instead? Well, they can only praise God. That's their reaction when they've been overcome by the Holy Spirit. This seems to be what's happening here. The Spirit has overcome, uh, come on their lives, they're no longer in control of their faculties as they should be. Richard Phillips writes like this. Prophesying uh, seems to refer, or prophesying here seems to refer to an ecstatic state in which these men would speak with messages from God. So perhaps these men, they're praising God, perhaps they're blessing David. The point is that David is rescued through the direct intervention of the Holy Spirit. And the godly Samuel, he's too old now to do anything. They can only rely on the Holy Spirit to do something. This is the power of God, that he can intervene at a moment's notice. And here God intervenes by striking these murderous men with the awe of God, forcing them to acknowledge God and praise God. And if you haven't done so, there will be a time when you will be forced to acknowledge God on the last day of judgment. But Saul's men are forced to acknowledge uh, God before that day of judgment and do so in Holy Spirit-forced prophecy praising God. As Christians, we have the privilege of praising God freely, don't we? From the depths of our hearts and proclaiming God's truth and much sooner than that last day of judgment. And as we worship and proclaim through the power of the same spirit, God's enemies are converted, they're made into family. And even when the world is not converted, the power of the same spirit is still at work in us through prayer and scripture and praise, creating in us a sense of awe and preserves us for the day when we do enter God's kingdom. 
Well, this forceful prophesying of Saul's men didn't happen just once or twice, but happened three times. God was unstoppable in this passage, as He always is. And Saul's men were incap- incapacitated as they were forced into prophetic praise. And verse 22 we read, Then Saul himself went to Ramah. What, sh- what, what are we expecting will happen to Saul as well? Well, you guessed it, he too would be incapacitated with prophetic praise. The Spirit of God came upon him also, and as he went to prophesy, he, and he went to, uh, sorry, and as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah, and he stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it said, is Saul also among the prophets? Saul's under the influence of the Holy Spirit, disarmed, and he's disrobed himself. This is a scene of Saul's humiliation. No matter how hard Saul conspired for evil, God acted in greater and greater ways to the point where Saul is now naked, unable to help, help himself but, uh, but praise his Creator. And the final statement here is Saul also among the prophets. Isn't a statement of praise to Saul, as in, you know, wow, Saul is a, is a prophet like Samuel. This was the confusion of the crowds as they looked on at the erratic behavior of their godly king. Uh, God and God and Kelly writes it like like this. God sovereignly intervened and manifested His power in such a way to express His disapproval of Saul's intent towards David and expose him to the self-destructive uh, his self-destructive ways. Well, I thought this was an incredible chapter. Do you? Uh, there's an incredible warning here for anyone who would set themselves up against their Creator. And all through this chapter, we see God's mercy. We see God's mercy as Saul's sinful madness is exposed by, to, to, to lots of people. Uh, his sinful madness is seen by his children, by Samuel, by David, by Jonathan, by Michal, for what it is. They can see that Saul uh, is, a, is a man in rebellion against God. Mercy was also extended to Saul himself. Remember, Jonathan tried to correct Saul and implored him to turn from his sin. Mercy is extended to Samuel and David. At the 11th hour, as Saul's men close in on their target, David, God overrides the will of those murderers by sending His Spirit. And now we ask the question, uh, is this how we should experience uh, the Holy Spirit in our life? You know, if the enemies of God are surrounding us, should we expect God to intervene through His Spirit, in, in, just like He has here? And as much as we'd like that, and perhaps by God's grace, some people have experienced that, that Scripture and church history would tell us that faithfulness through suffering is the normal path that the Christian now walks. I like how Ralph David expresses his thought, this thought, that we don't need to share David's experience. It is enough to know David's God. If you, like Saul, are determined to persist in sin and especially to oppose God's anointed, that is Christ, there's a warning for you here. And David sang this warning in his psalm, in verse 8. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold the nations in derision. You mock the nations for their rebellion. However, for those of you who hope in God, the promise of David's psalm will satisfy your soul. O my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O God, are my fortress. My God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. That's good news, isn't it? That the people of God are safe, within the walls of God's mighty protection. That we're freed, like David and Jonathan. We're not forced like Saul and his murderous men. We are free to lift our voices in praise. And on this side of the cross, we have a similar task of Samuel and the prophets. That is, to proclaim God's truth with great joy in the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of God. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. It's full of your mercy and goodness to your servant, David. You kept him safe, even while being pursued by bloodthirsty enemies. And when there was no longer any physical solution to David's escape, you incapacitated your enemies through your Holy Spirit. And while we know that our experience won't be like David's or of our precious Saviour, we acknowledge that we don't need those experiences. To know you is enough. And you'll protect us and keep us to complete the appointed task that you have for us. May we be faithful in completing the task that you've given to us. And just as David prayed in his psalm, may we not be afraid of the enemies that gather against us, but know that you mock them in laughter. You will cause them to topple and you will keep us safe 
as though we are in a fortress. Keep us safe, Lord, we pray. Keep our children safe. Keep our church safe. Not, not primarily with physical safety, but spiritual safety and preservation and growth of our faith. May we be faithful and freely and joyfully proclaiming the good news. May we bend the knee in joyful submission, uh, like Jonathan and Samuel and David do in this passage, not to be forced like Saul and his band of murderers. Help us live godly and obedient lives for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Let's stand and sing this last song. As with David, the Lord was in charge of the battle, and as it is for us today, the battle does belong to the Lord. session after a little bit later on um, yeah please join in with that as well thanks
darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my mercy Before.